All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just gonna make sure, Johnny, okay, perfect. We can, everyone seems to be able to hear us. I hope everyone can see the slides. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and the slides will be posted on the Alliance website afterwards. So please feel free to reference them afterwards. Today's webinar is on infill black carbon emissions of liquid gas and high performing biomass stoves. First of all, I just want to thank everyone for joining. We have about 68 people, 71 people on the webinar now, and we had about 290 people register. So I hope we'll have some more people joining us shortly. Um, thank you all for taking the time. I know it's late for some of you around the world and very early for others of you. Um, this webinar today will examine the results of two research studies that were commissioned by the Clean Cooking Alliance and funded by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to understand the infill black carbon emissions from liquid gas and high performing biomass stoves. Today we are joined by Yakvin Gorzo, who is the Finance and Household Energy Initiative Coordinator for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And as I said, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition funded this work, so we're really grateful to them and for Yakvin being able to join us today. Um, Donnie Alexander, who's the Senior Director of Evidence and Impact for the Clean Cooking Alliance, where she leads the Alliance's efforts related to environment, climate, air pollution, public health standards, technologies, fuels, and monitoring evaluation. Um, she'll be giving the introduction in a minute. We're also really grateful to both Ryan Thompson and Andy Grishup, who are researchers. They've actually flown into DC to be with us in the office today for this presentation. Uh, Ryan is the head of Mountaineer Engineering, a mechanical and environmental engineering firm that specializes in residential and industrial air quality sampling. He is a specialist in conducting field monitoring of cooking and heating technologies for usage, efficiency, and emissions. And some of you on the phone might also know Ryan as he is the convener of working group three on field testing message, which is, if I get this right, part of ISO TC285 on clean cook stoves and clean cooking solutions. We're also joined by Andy Grishup. He is an assistant professor at North Carolina State University, where he focuses on the sources and evolution of atmospheric aerosols, characterization of in-use emissions from mobile and stationary combustion sources, and the linkages between air pollution, emissions, and climate change. I am also, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, but I am Katie Pogue. I am the manager of environment climate here at the Clean Cooking Alliance. Forgetting how to advance the slides. So today's webinar, like I said, is going to focus on the research from these two studies. We're going to start with a welcome and overview from Donnie Alexander. Um, then Yakvin is going to introduce the Climate and Clear, Clean Air Coalition. Then we'll have a presentation from Ryan on the Nepal research, and then Andy will focus on the Rwanda research. I'm going to wrap us up with some implications of this research for the sector at large. We'll reserve time for question and answers at the end. Um, then Donnie will wrap us up. And then I'll encourage you all, there should be a participant survey once the webinar ends that will pop up. Um, I encourage you all to fill this out. This is gonna help us tailor these webinars in the future to make sure they're the most useful for the maximum number of people. So you'll hear me plug this a couple times, but please do fill out the participant survey. Um, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Donnie Alexander. Hi, Katie. Um, thank you very much, uh, and thanks for the nice introduction. So we're really excited today, uh, as Katie said, to, to um, go over this research that we've been waiting on for, for quite a while. It's, it's really exciting. So I will get started here. Um, and I think everybody understands the, the issue that 3 billion people depend on polluting open fires and inefficient stoves um, to cook their food. What we don't understand is what are those environmental impacts? We know that there are impacts, but we don't understand um, what the impacts, uh, excuse me, the benefits are of really switching to the cleanest and highest performing technologies in the field. So we wanna understand the benefits that we see to the climate uh, of, of these technologies. So this is why we commissioned this research uh, a couple of years ago to really get an understanding of what is that magnitude of benefit that we're seeing. 
One of the key things that is important uh, as one of the things that is um, that we talk about is black carbon emissions. And that is because it occurs due to the incomplete combustion of biomass. And it's really um, a, a significant um, source of both climate change and air pollution. And so over the years, this has become increasingly important for us to get an understanding of, you know, do these stoves provide benefits in reduction in black carbon and what is the magnitude of those benefits, like I said. Um, and that has been a question that we've had for quite a few years. We know that up to 25% of black carbon emissions come from household solid fuel use. There's some data that say even more, but there hasn't been really a lot of data to show us what that the benefit in the field is. There's laboratory data and there is some field data, but not a lot on the highest performing um, biomass stoves and some of the liquid, liquid fuels, like we said. So we see from the the lab data that there that it indicates that we will see a benefit, but we really want to understand what that true benefit is. So this is why we commissioned this research, and I'm really excited um, today to have our partner um, Yakbin uh, um, from Climate and Clean Air Coalition, as they are the funders of this and really have been driving all of the efforts to understand, you know, the the importance of black carbon on the climate. And so this is really great to have her here. And so I'd like to have um, uh, her. Uh, really talk about their importance. Sorry, I didn't uh, go over here the background, I, and I think both of Ryan and um, Andy will do a good job of talking about their uh, their studies. But the first study that Ryan is doing, or that, that um, Andy will be talking about, is in Rwanda, where they're using a forced gas pellet dras gasifier. And in Nepal, we um, Ryan is talking about biogas and LPG, and then looking at the baseline of wood cook stoves. So I'll let uh, Yakbun take it from here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Donny. I just wanted to give an introduction to the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and why it's important for us to understand the, uh, the impact from the stoves. I mean, the key message really is that uh, air pollution is the biggest environmental health risk. 6.5 million premature deaths per year are due to um, air pollution. So I think the message is very clear. It has an impact at the household level uh, through open cooking, but also at the urban and peri-urban and, of course, regional and global levels. So we, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is the only global effort um, that look towards reducing short-lived climate pollutants, SLPs. So these are substances with relatively short lifetime in the atmosphere and a warming uh, They're very powerful climate forces and dangerous air pollutants. They have an impact on human health, agriculture, and ecosystems. So we, um, we have an opportunity to improve public health, uh, food security, uh, through working on this SLCP. So the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is organized um, around what we call initiatives. Uh, we do have 11 um, initiatives in total. One of them is the Household Energy Initiative. The other one is Finance, which is uh, cross cutting And really, I think what's really important for us is the black carbon emissions trends. Um, Biomass use for cooking and heating is estimated to contribute to 25% of black carbon emissions globally. So the solution to the problem requires concerted efforts going beyond the energy sector, um, especially in the um, developing countries. It's one of the most important solutions to, um, to address the impact of biomass use. The CCAC, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, is working with WHO, the Clean Cooking Alliance, we have many other partners to provide for improved practices and fuels for both domestic cooking and heating, um, and also on lighting to reduce black carbon emissions. And so I think the CCAC is uniquely positioned to tackle both the health and climate impacts. Um, CCAC has today more than 130 partners. We're uniting UN Environment, WHO, more than 60 countries, many more NGOs, working together to reduce black carbon, methane, HFCs from uh, cooking, heating, up and burning, municipal solid waste also. And we're partnering with nations as well as uh, public, private, and nonprofit organizations 
to address the production, deployment, and use of clean cookstoves and fuels in the developing world. So again, I mean, my main message is that among the options for reducing black carbon emissions, residential stove and fuel interventions offer the highest net benefits for co per cost. So it was very important for us to be able to support that work. And I'm also really looking forward to, um, to hearing the results from the uh, studies in Rwanda uh, and Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you, your friend. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Ryan to discuss the results from the Nepal study. Okay. Hello. So, um, okay, so I'm Ryan. The, the objectives of this study uh, were to measure the emission factors of health and climate relevant emissions. Uh, so those emissions include black carbon, organic carbon, particulate matter, and carbon monoxide. Uh, in this presentation, um, BC, well, in the study, BC was measured as elemental carbon, EC. So that's what it will be referred to in this presentation. We measured emissions from biogas, LPG, and wood stoves. LPG is liquefied petroleum gas. And these measurements were done during uncontrolled field settings where people were cooking naturally in their homes, uh, cooking whatever they wanted to cook. And so we're measuring the emissions of um, whatever was being cooked also. Okay, so there's a lot of project partners. Um, I had my hands in uh, pretty much all aspects of the project. Cheryl at the University of Illinois did uh, most of the study design and data analysis. The filters were analyzed in Dr. Tammy Bond's laboratory. Um, so Tammy was supposed to do all the filter analysis, but um, it turns out that she didn't do it and she just hired an undergrad to do it instead. So go figure. But um, Basadev helped a lot on the ground uh, in Nepal with the work there. Nicholas Lamb uh, helped a lot with um, just technical oversight of the project. Leaders Nepal, Amod uh, helped uh, on the ground uh, facilitating uh, things at the field site. CRTN um, in Nepal did the field work and of course uh, CCAC and CCA. Okay, so why biogas? Uh, well, first, let's take a step back and say, what is biogas? So what we're measuring here is um, household biogas systems. So they're household anaerobic digesters, and um, they're generating biogas, which is mostly methane, and it's connected to a stove with a pipe. And uh, so it's a, the benefits of biogas, it's a clean, local, and renewable fuel and the digester also produces a uh, high quality organic fertilizer. Um, compared to LPG, biogas can be more appropriate in rural areas where distribution network is not um, practical or cost effective. So, um, and these systems have been proven to work. There's long-term adoption of over 20 years uh, and they're widespread. There's over 300,000 systems household systems in Nepal in use. There's over a million in India and several million in China. <clears throat> okay, so the study area was Panchkal, Nepal, which is in the Kaveri Palanchok district. It's a couple hours from Kathmandu. Um, it's about 1,000 meters elevation. It's in the low hills. So why we chose this area is because, well, they had a, the, a mixture of biogas, LPG, and wood stoves um, that residents were using in this area. Um, it was accessible. It, it was not, not too far from Kathmandu, unlike most places in Nepal. And there's also uh, leaders. Nepal is conducting an ongoing health study there. So we could leverage data and resources. 
Um, it's also uh, been chosen by CCA um, as a place where they're focusing on clean cooking technologies there. Uh, on a clear day like this, you can see the Himalaya in the north. There's Mount Ganchimpo in the center there. Uh, so here's a picture of the wood stoves. On the left is the typical stoves for cooking uh, meals. On the right is a larger stove that's used for um, heating animal food and, and heating water. Here's a picture of, well, the biogas stove is on the left and the LPG stove is on the right. Here's a uh, sketches of the biogas systems out of the biogas system manual. Um, if uh, you can't read Sanskrit, just try your best to follow along. Um, so basically there's a tank and the tank is buried in the ground in the yard. And that's connected to a inlet, a, a mixer inlet, which um, where the cow dung is mixed with water. And then there's also an outlet that the slurry comes out of. And then the pic photo on the right also shows that tank connected to a toilet. So most of the systems in this area had a toilet and a mixer connected. Here's a picture on the left is the, the toilet room and the mixer. And on the right shows um, dung being added to the mixer. Okay, so equipment. Uh, well, let's just start in the center at the stove, or in this case, the open fire. This is not drawn to scale. Um, we used a Fumatron sensor box. It was from uh, developed at the University of Illinois. It's been used extensively in Nepal to measure wood stove emissions in previous studies. So it's a portable sampling system. Um, so it has the filter holders for gravimetric filter analysis and OCEC analysis, uh, measures CO, CO2, and it's a dilution sampler um, to capture representative emission sample of semi-volatile particulate matter. Uh, but we needed to measure more things for this study, so we added a second sensor box called the Musako Nak Gober Gas sensor box that's Nepalese, it translates to rat nose biogas. So the rat nose um, instrument was constructed for a separate CCAC project to measure black carbon emissions from brick kilns. And so we just took that sensing platform and put on different sensors for this application. So we added a, a PM light scattering sensor to measure the real time background concentration of the particulate matter. The Fumatron already measures background concentrations of CO and CO2. Um, it also has the, the TAP, the tricolor absorption photometer by Brechtel uh, that measures PM light absorption and the red, green, and blue wavelength. And then we also added a flow sensor and um, to measure the biogas flow rate and then um, and also sensors to measure the composition of the biogas so we could determine the carbon fraction and the heating value of the biogas. So here's a picture of the equipment installed during a cooking event. In the middle here is the Musako Nak Gober gas. To the right is the Fumatron. You can see the, the gas, the biogas is running through this instrument to measure the flow. And then um, up above, Here's the stove, the biogas stove, and up above is the, the sample probe. Okay, so the sampling plant, we measured in three seasons, monsoon, spring, and winter, because uh, previous studies showed there is um, seasonal trends to the household energy um, supply and demand. Um, monsoon is wet, rainy, winter is dry and cold, spring is in between. Um, there was, we measured 20 homes in each season for 79 cooking events, 57 biogas, 16 wood, 6 LPG. And we measured a variety of cooking tasks, uh, cooking rice, lentils, tea, boiling milk, heating water, 
frying vegetables, cooking, etc. Okay, so starting with the results. Um, biogas properties. The biogas is pretty consistent across all seasons and um, between households. 59% methane, 27% carbon dioxide. Heating value, 21 megajoules per kilogram. Uh, results, uh, PM 2.5. So the PM emission factors from the gas cooking events were 50 times lower than the wood. So you can see the plot on the right. Um, that's actually two plots. If you look at the big plot, it shows wood and gas cooking on the same axes. Um, yeah, the wood was 408, while the gas was um, biogas 7.4, LPG 9.5. And then you can look at the zoomed in plot for, which shows the distribution of uh, gas cooking. There was no um, significant difference in the seasonal variability for the gas cooking emissions. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the climate impact? Okay, so the climate impact of the aerosols from the gas cooking is cooling and very small. So black carbon was a small fraction, about 3% of the total particle emissions. And EC emission factors of gas cooking were 200 times lower than the wood cooking events. So you can see the same trend on the axes here, orders of magnitude higher for wood. Um, so the climate impact of aerosols is an important piece of the puzzle to understand the total climate impact. Um, there are other pieces of the puzzle also, um, to put it in context. The CO2 emissions, the renewability of the fuel, you know, the other short-lived climate pollutants. For the biogas systems, you'd want to look at the leaks that are happening around the digester. Um, for LPG, we'd want to look at the, you know, production and transportation emissions and just do full, uh, just look at the full life cycle emissions. So CO emissions, um, biogas stove CO emissions were about double LPG, and they were uh, wood emission, or one fifth that of wood stove CO emissions. And the biogas stove CO emissions were influenced by uh, the primary air adjustment on the stove. Uh, so these Biogas stoves have a valve to adjust the primary air. And in the top photo, uh, you can from the manual, you can see, you may think that that's a, at first glance, that that's like a voice bubble and the stove is talking. But at a closer inspection, you can see it's actually just a close-up view of the valve. And what those instructions are telling you is that the stove should be run with the valve open and it should only be closed when you're lighting the stove. But um, the cooking, it's common every day people are cooking with, uh, or they're frying with oil and the oil is spraying and the stoves, they've been doing this for years and the stoves are coated with this sticky oil. So the valves are stuck. Now the bottom picture shows a valve stuck half open. So some of the valves were stuck open, some of the valves were stuck halfway open, some of the valves were closed, some of the valves weren't stuck. But um, basically the stoves with the valve closed were had twice, the CO emissions were twice as high as the stoves with the valve open. We also did a controlled test at the RETS laboratory in Kathmandu, the Renewable Energy Testing Center, and um, the CO emissions changed by a factor of three when the primary air valve was adjusted. Um, okay, I'm not going to go into much detail on this, but uh, basically, to, to compare these, our results with previous literature, uh, in general, they're uh, within range. And But all the previous, uh, pub previously published results are like water boiling tests, controlled tests, and they're not measuring um, the, you know, cooking emissions. So in that regard, you... Um, you would expect our emissions to be higher since we are including uh, cooking emissions. 
Okay, so he more about cooking ambition. So basically we're recording notes during the cooking event about what was being cooked and like if they were frying or if they're lighting the stove. And then we can, um, and we also collected the real time data to show uh, when the emissions are occurring. And so we can apportion the total emissions to different activities. And so about 90% of the PM emissions are attributed to frying and about 30% of the EC emissions were attributed to frying. So um, yeah, so um, PM and organic carbon emissions were strongly correlated with frying activity. Um, the EC emissions were not strong, not, you know, the correlation was not as strong. And then for CO, there was no correlation. It's like the CO was coming from the fuel and no indication it was coming from the food. Okay, so there's um, these, there's two types of detection limits that we're bumping into with these measurements. Uh, the first one is just the, the filter loading. Uh, this is sort of particle detection limits of so PM, EC, and OC. Um, there's a minimum amount of mass we can detect on the filter with the filter analysis. And so we, following standard convention, we define it as a uh, limited detection as three times the standard deviation of field blanks. So during each season, we took five to 10 field blanks, analyzed those to determine the limit of detection. There's another detection limit caused by the background concentrations because the emission, we're measuring the plume concentration and we're measuring the background concentration and the emission concentration is uh, the difference. And uh, sometimes the plume concentration was lower and the background concentration. And so that would result in a negative emission factor. And so basically the background concentration sets uh, a detection limit below which we cannot, it would set like it sets an upper bound of the emission, but below which we cannot quantify precisely the uh, emission factor. Um, okay, so we can take the detection limit and propagate that to an emission factor to calculate a detection limit emission factor. Um, so this shows, this shot, this plot is for PM 2.5, which uh, for all the gas cooking events, but it's, the trend looks very similar for EC or OC. Um, the white bar is the emission factor based on the total mass collected on the filter. And then the black diamond is the reported emission factor after the background subtraction. And so if, um, if there's negative mass detected on the filter, then you have a negative emission factor. And if, there's, um, if the background concentration is higher, then the, um, then the plume concentration, then you also have a negative emission factor. So, but the, but the conclusion of this is that the average detection limit was about the same magnitude as the, our average emission factor. So all our measurements were about at our detection limit. Uh, we, but we can also see from this that the top end of the, dis, the upper half of the distribution, we, we could measure those measurements pretty well. Like we have a pretty good measurement above detection limit of the upper end of the distribution. And then the, the lower distribution just somewhere between there and zero. So we have the results very well constrained, even though there is uncertainty due to the detection limit. And you can censor the data by like forcing, by like treating values as zero, negative values as zero, or values below the detection limit as zero. And it, it really doesn't change the conclusions. We still have the results constrained regardless of how the data is censored. So here's a comparison with ISO performance targets. So the public, the standard was published this year, 19, ISO 19867-3, which uh, recommends performance tiers. Um, and so these are for laboratory testing, but we're just plotting our results on here for comparison. So both the biogas and LPG stoves are in tier five and tier four. So tier five is the best tier. It's aspirationally high level that uh, protects health. In tier four is uh, pretty good too. Um, and so for comparison though, I, I plotted the detection limit on here too to show you that all we can really detect though is tier four. Uh, if you, if you know, these stoves, some of these stoves could be tier five, 
But if you really want to know that for sure, you would need to do controlled testing with clean background air. You're not going to be able to do detect that in these field settings um, with a higher background. Uh, so in conclusion, um, the biogas and LPG stoves, they are clean cooking fuels in real world settings. Um, the aerosols for biogas and LPG cooking are slightly climate cooling, but um, and the majority of PM emissions are from frying the food, not from the fuel. Uh, another important conclusion, though, is to, to consider is that the gas stoves um, do not meet all the household energy needs. Uh, wood remains a major household <laughs> energy fuel and um, was a source of the high background emissions when we were trying to measure these gas stoves. Uh, so in the future, we're looking um, at a few things. So during this study, we also collected household energy consumption data and uh, stove usage data. And so we can actually calculate household level emission rates and include emissions of all the stoves. Um, and we, we can also look more closely to see how the um, aerosol piece of the puzzle for climate impacts compares to other pieces of the puzzle. Um, it was also in this area, the, um, it, it became clear that a lot of the systems needed maintenance, you know, and that um, the biogas use could be improved a lot if there was a maintenance program in place. Um, and then as some of us are also looking into um, biogas designs, they're more appropriate in, in cooler climates, like, you know, higher elevations in Nepal. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that presentation. <laughs> so I see that we have a couple questions. We are gonna save all questions for the end, so we make sure to get through the presentations, and then I will ask for people to be using the question box um, in your, in the tab on the webinar. So feel free to be writing questions as we go along and we'll be sure to get to as many of those as possible um, later on in the presentation. So at this time, we're gonna move on to the results from the Rwanda study. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andy. All right, thanks. Uh, very happy to be here and hi to all out, out in the internet land. Um, so uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, uh, Dr. Wyatt Champion, who was a postdoc working with me, who basically did most of the work on this project. Um, I'm here um, taking the glory for him. But, uh, and you can see from the title, I'm not really burying the lead here. Um, what we found is essentially that these pellet gas fires that we tested are, are very clean, which relative to my previous work in this area is very nice because we've, as you'll see, have some experience uh, delivering bad news. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge Inyan Yeri, who is our partner in this and who is the sort of implementer of this. And then, of course, uh, Clean Climate uh, clean Cl climate and Clean Air Coalition and the Clean Cooking Alliance for funding the work. Um, so just a brief road map. Um, I'm going to talk about why a pellet and gas fire stove might be a good idea, uh, why we worked in Rwanda, um, a brief sort of overview of what we did. And I think Ryan provide a lot of background, so I get to go quickly through that. Um, the results include emission factors and emission rates that we measured in the field, some information on optical properties of particles, um, some discussion of the distribution of performance um, both across tests and within, within tests, and then some about the implications of, uh, of our findings. This is an image of the Indian Yeri headquarters and one of their delivery vehicles. Um, so for some context, uh, you know, we, we're interested in climate, reducing climate impacts and health impacts. And you can see this is a sort of framework that I'll use a few times in this talk with climate impacts on the vertical axis and health impacts on the horizontal axis. And, you know, we know that traditional cooking approaches have these large, uh, large impacts in both dimensions. What we want to do is reduce them. And I'm showing some results from some work that we did a couple years ago in Malawi, also funded by um, CCA. Um, 
And what we want is to move towards something that has minimal impacts. And so I have LPG here, and you know there are other options like biogas that Ryan just talked about, which might you know end us down towards the you know origin here or having very low impacts. And we'd also like biomass stoves to do that. And so there's been uh, you know various models of stoves. This is a, a Philips stove using biomass being tested in my lab. And there's uh, a lot of potential for providing benefits in both these dimensions. And so kind of what our expectations uh, um, are. But what we found testing these in the labs is that we were typically far from meeting that, that um, potential or that expectation. And so this is the same stove being tested in a home in Rwanda. And, and uh, we saw basically much poorer performance than you would expect um, based on lab testing. And a, lot, a big part of what drove that is if you look closely here, you can see that there's fuel kind of sticking out of the top of the stove. And it's not operating in the way it's intended to operate. And it's because processing fuel to the level needed is a lot of work. And so people often won't do it. Um, and so this is instructions from uh, the African Clean Energy Stove Gasifier saying, you know, you shouldn't have fuel sticking out of the top. But, uh, it's not trivial to, to process fuel to that level, and so it often doesn't get done. So what Enyanyiri, uh, which is this company in Rwanda, has done is focus on not only the stove, but also the fuel, and then how that it sort of is incorporated into a household. Um, and so um, they are a social enterprise, so a business that's trying to do good, um, and they are implementing or distributing it currently the Mimi Moto stoves, which I'll talk about in a second, and also locally produced biomass uh, fuel pellets, which are, are shown here. Um, the, the business model is very interesting. The idea is that households pay for pellets and not for the stove. So they get stoves for free as long as they're buying pellets. Um, and these are competing with, in the, in the urban areas, uh, charcoal, and then also uh, against fuel wood in, in urban and, and mostly rural areas. There's a very big emphasis on customer service and follow-up and training, um, which I won't talk about, but um, that's an important part of the, the puzzle here. And uh, Pam Jagger and Ipsita Das have a paper in energy or sustainable development that uh, talks more about that, um, if you're interested. The stove, uh, I think many are probably familiar with the Mimi Moto, is a fan, uh, fan or force draft uh, gasifier that's made to be operated with pellets. It has this removable combustion chamber. Here's um, some pellets. And the lab tests that had been done at the time we started this was by uh, Colorado State, and they found it to be tier four for emissions and efficiency. Um, and this is with the, the sort of old tier um, stand, uh, system. So very promising based on lab results, but as I discussed before, this is, does not mean you can assume it will work that way in the field. Um, Engineering is headquartered in Gisenyi, Rwanda, which is a small city, about 40,000 people uh, right near the border or on the border with the Congo. And that's their headquarters. And it's also been the main the sort of pilot location. And they have several thousand uh, customers in that area at this point. And they're also working in, uh, in refugee camps now. So just a quick background on Rwanda, small country in eastern Africa. Um, it is the most densely populated country in Africa. Um, and uh, as much of Sub-Saharan Africa, the vast majority of the population relies on solid fuel, solid, solid biomass for cooking. So wood in rural areas, which leads to very high deforestation, and wood and charcoal in, uh, in urban areas. So where we were working, uh, charcoal was very much dominant in the cities. Um, and like other places where solid fuel is the dominant fuel, you have very high impacts on, on health. So um, the global burden of disease found that the leading uh, cause of loss of life is lower respiratory uh, infection, which is obviously very driven by uh, solid fuel use. So what we did was in-home test both of the Mimimoto, but also the stoves that it is offsetting. And this is an image showing the Mimimoto under test in an outside setting. Um, this is our equipment and this is a probe. So very similar to the type of thing that Ryan just discussed. Um, we essentially worked with Engineeri to randomize household selection from their customer base. Um, for our pellet tests, 70% of them were in Gisenye and 30% were outside in rural areas. And then in the rural areas, we also tested some baseline households that use wood. 
and in urban settings, we we tested charcoal um, homes. We we tested during two seasons in the same set of households, and the idea was to sort of get at the seasonality. Um, we actually found essentially, well, only for charcoal, any sense sense uh, or any seasonality. So for the results, I'm just going to be kind of lumping lumping things together. Um, the equipment is what we call a stem stove emission measurement system, which is shown here. Um, it, it uses a plume sampling probe, like Ryan discussed. Um, it measures CO and CO2 and real-time light scattering and absorption by particles. And then we also collect filters for PM2.5 mass and organic and elemental carbon. And we use the carbon balance method for emission factors. So we're using carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide as indicators of fuel carbon. And then all of these tests were uncontrolled cooking tests, so we're not telling uh, households what to do. They're just doing their sort of normal cooking, and we're set up and hopefully not disrupting their activity. Um, just another image of the of the um, stems in action. Here's the system and the car battery that powers it, and a laptop collecting data. This is a piece of conductive tubing going to the probe uh, indoors. And this is just a close-up of the system. It's built around um, the Aprovecho um, PEMS sensor box, which Ryan helped uh, develop, I think. And then we have some filters and a, a microethylometer for black carbon measurements. Uh, in terms of test numbers, we, uh, we the Royal We, uh, conducted uh, 59 pellet tests and 16 each of wood and charcoal tests. These are just some images. Again, this is across two seasons, and typically we did two tests per season per household. Um, so it's on the order of 20, I think 22 households total. To get into results, um, this I'll spend a little bit of time laying out this plot because you'll see a few of them. This is a, a in this case, PM 2.5 emission factor, so in grams per kilogram of fuel um, for pellet in red, uh, wood in this sort of gold color, and charcoal in dark blue. And what these show, the points here show individual test data, and the boxes show uh, the 90th, 75th, um, median, uh, 25th, and 10th percentile. And then this dot here shows the mean. Um, and so what you can see right away is that the pellets are, pellet uh, emission factors are vastly lower than the um, emission factors for these baseline stoves. And in terms of emission factors, they're 97% lower than wood and about 90% lower than charcoal. Um, if you, um, if you uh, think about literature comparison, we have a, a set of literature data over here. And so um, this P is the, the one lab test for the, for the Minimoto that was available. And you can see where our mean is sort of in line with that. And we'll, we'll zoom in a bit more in a later slide. And you can see that our wood uh, stove emissions are a bit higher than most of the literature values here that are indicated with a W. And we mainly attribute that to the fact that um, a major fuel in use was elephant grass, which is kind of a, a grassy fuel and not that typical for um, other settings. And then our charcoal emission factors are pretty much in line with what other people saw, though we, we did see some very high events. If you look at uh, emission rates, so we're basically taking these emission factors and then our measurements of fuel use during, during each test and calculating emission rates. And you see a similar picture. Um, and if you compare the pellet to wood, it's actually 99% reduction. So it's a pretty vast reduction in emission rates. And I'll, I'll zoom in on this in a little bit so you can kind of see this relative to uh, tier standards. Uh, but in general, we have uh, tier three, uh, and this is the old tier. So again, this is the tiers are not intended for field measurements, but we're just using them as a kind of a benchmark. Uh, the, the median emission factor is tier three. If you compare uh, these emission factors for the Mimimoto with pellets versus what we measured in Rwanda with the Phillips, it's about an order of magnitude lower. So the, the sort of addition of the pellets um, makes a very large difference here. Um, we do, this is the same sort of plot for carbon monoxide, and you can also see a really huge uh, difference, so about 87% reduction in emission factor um, relative to wood and a 95% reduction relative to charcoal. Charcoal, as many of you know, emits tons of CO, so it has very high emission factors. Um, 
If you look at emission rates, again, it's an even more dramatic difference because of the reduced fuel consumption uh, by the pellet stove. Um, and so this, uh, this is about a 95% reduction in emission rate um, relative to wood. Uh, and uh, relative to these old uh, IWA tiers, um, it's classified as tier four. So this is just zooming in on just the pellet data um, and then showing these old IWA tiers. So not this is a, a bit of a different tier system than what Ryan discussed. And you can see the individual data. You can see that we do have a number of pellet tests for PM uh, that are kind of at our detection limit. They're shown at zero, but uh, it's actually not zero. You can see our median value here is, um, our mean value is just at the sort of tier three boundary and our median value is tier three and a number of tests that are sort of in tier four range. And you can see that we're, you know, a lot of our tests are above the lab um, results, but we definitely have some in the same, same uh, realm. Similar idea for, for carbon monoxide here on the right. Um, focusing on the particles, I'll first, first talk about just sort of the properties of the particles. So uh, Ryan talked about the sort of relative climate impact. And so these are particle specific properties. So not, not extensive, not the amount of particles, but just the properties. And this is showing the fraction of total carbon, which is organic carbon plus elemental carbon that's contributed by EC. So the higher this is, the more of the particles are sooty carbon. Um, and uh, the lower is, is more uh, organic carbon. And you can see that the, the fraction is highest for the pellet stoves. It's quite variable. Um, these are uh, sort of darker uh, or more EC dominated particles. Um, if you look at the optical properties, this is showing um, single scattering albedo, which is the fraction of particle uh, light extinction that is from scattering. So up here will be very scattering particles and down here would be very absorbing particles. You see that kind of as you expect when you have more sooty carbon or EC, you have more absorbing particles. So from a, you know, just looking at just the particle uh, properties, this, this would be potentially more warming. But you really have to take into account not only the properties, but the amounts. And so this is showing EC emission factors. So again, as Ryan mentioned, EC and BC are kind of used uh, somewhat interchangeably. Um, and you can see the, the emission factors of EC are drastically lower for, um, for the pellet stove uh, relative to either of the, the baseline stoves, especially wood. Um, charcoal does not tend to emit much uh, EC. If you look at emission rates, uh, kind of similar story. And this is a again, a, about a 99% reduction in EC emissions. So although the, the particles are a little bit more absorbing, um, there's much, much less of them. And so the net, that's going to be really driving uh, climate, uh, sort of reduction of climate impacts. So as you probably noticed looking at the data, there's a, a lot of spread in the, in the um, performance of these. And so to kind of take hone in on this a little bit more. We're going to look at cumulative distribution functions of PM and CO emission factors. So what this is describing is basically how many of the overall tests lie below a given emission factor. So if we look at um, the PM 2.5, again, the, the color uh, is the same as before. Um, this is the distribution of emission factors from our pellet tests. And if you look at just a, a specific point here, what this is showing is that about 90% of the emission factors are below around two grams per kilogram. Um, and so for the most part, these are very, very clean, but you have a set of tests. And in fact, this is around six tests where we had much higher um, PM emissions. And in fact, you know, at this 90th percentile, the, the stoves, um, the dirtier tests are actually dirtier than the cleanest charcoal tests. Um, so that, you know, certainly warrants closer looking. You can see the charcoal is sort of intermediate and the wood are all dirtier than pretty much all of the pellet stove tests. If we look at carbon monoxide, um, you can see that uh, um, a clear distribution with charcoal um, at the highest end. So we're going to, I'm going to separate out these high emitting pellet stoves uh, in a, in for, for uh, the next slide. So th th these will be considered pellet high. Um, and what these looked like in practice was what we called smoke bombs. So the, the pellet stoves are not operated sort of um, as 
as they're supposed to be, you can get these very smoky events. Um, so this is a different way of looking at the distribution of, of the emissions. And so instead of being across multiple tests, this is across the time duration of a test. So this is showing the fraction of test duration. So from, you know, this is the start of the test and this is the end of the test. And then the y-axis is showing the amount, the fraction of pollutant emitted from none to all. And so this dotted line is just the one-to-one -one line, and that would be what it would follow if all the emissions were happening at the same rate throughout the test. And so you can see for charcoal and wood, for carbon monoxide, it's kind of doing that. Um, the pellet stove, we're separating out the, the, the pellet sort of normal performing and high performing or high emitting test with the, the high emitted ones being these dotted lines. And the, the cloud is sort of showing the range across different tests with the line just showing the, the mean. And so you can see, uh, you know, for the high emitting stoves, the carbon monoxide is being emitted at a greater, at a faster rate early in the test and at the end of the test. Um, if we look at PM scattering, we see kind of the same thing and it's, and it's a bit more dramatic. So you can see these very steep events in the beginning and at the end of the test. And what that's telling us is that a lot of these emissions are occurring during startup and shutdown of a test. Um, for the wood and the charcoal, you see that a startup has a very, you know, has a sort of disproportionate impact on emissions. And if you look at BC, you see the same, the same thing. You see these episodic um, contributions, and that's, you know, really startup and uh, either refueling or burnout. And you see kind of charcoal startup is really a big part of the overall emissions. Um, how are we doing on time? We're running a little bit behind. Okay, I think I'm just going to skip this. Um, but uh, this is just some more information on patterns of emissions. Um, but I want to get to the, um, the kind of takeaway. So what I'm going to talk about here is a, a framework to try to put these emission factors and emission measurements in context. And it's using a framework that um, myself and some colleagues developed a couple years ago. So if you want more detail, you can check out this paper. Um, but the idea is that we're going to take an energy demand for cooking and we're going to use information about efficiency of different stoves to estimate how much fuel each stove uses. And then we're going to use emission factors that we measure either in the field or we get um, from the literature to calculate pollutant emissions. And on one hand, we're going to use that to calculate to sort of estimate a net climate impact in terms of CO2 equivalents. So this is kind of our climate axis. And then for health, we're going to use these uh, emissions to estimate uh, what someone would be exposed to in their house. So these are estimates, and I will, um, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a relatively crude modeling framework. Um, and then finally, we're going to take that exposure and we're going to estimate mortality risk. Um, a couple just important details to, to point out. When we're doing in this, in this results I'm going to show, when we look at uh, the climate impacts, we're also going to account for upstream emissions for the, those that have them. So charcoal, LPG, and pellets, they all have either energy or other processes that, that have emissions associated with them. So that we're incorporating that in these estimates. Um, and an important modifier for this is the level of renewability of the biomass. So the estimate for Rwanda is that only 2% of biomass is renewably harvested. It's a very densely populated and deforested place. Um, and we're going to model with that, but also with a 100% renewable scenario because uh, pellets are made out of sawdust, which is kind of a waste product. Um, and then we're using a dose response for uh, cardiovascular disease mortality, but you could use other disease endpoints and, and see fairly similar things. And one other thing to point out is that this is kind of an idealized framework, and it's assuming that the stove and the fuel is fully adopted, which is obviously not uh, a given at all. So just to kind of quickly run through results, this is uh, a plot showing climate on the vertical axis, and this is tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, but you don't really have to worry about the numbers too much. Um, and then the x-axis is showing health impact. So this is the lower axis, or the upper axis is showing intake, and the lower one is showing uh, relative risk of, of mortality. So you can just kind of think about, you know, a move in this direction as a move towards reduced uh, impacts. So this is showing uh, 
again, in the colors, the results from that are uh, estimated from the emission measurements I just showed, so charcoal, wood, and uh, pellet. And it's also showing with these X's uh, results from uh, lab-based emission factor measurements, uh, and then one field measurement here. So I'll just point out a couple things based on this. So the first thing is that you obviously have a very large benefit from moving from either wood or charcoal to the pellet stove. And you can see that the benefit is larger in the health space moving from wood and larger in the climate space moving from charcoal. Um, the charcoal impacts are very largely driven by the upstream uh, emissions from charcoal production. Um, other thing that you see is that, you know, the this LPG point is from lab-based measurements of LPG emissions. And you can see that we're sort of in the same ballpark in terms of both health and climate as LPG based on these field-based uh, emission measurements, which is very good. And so this error bar is showing the, the um, standard deviation of, of uh, mean, or no, I think it's showing the interquartile range of uh, around the median. Um, one thing to point out is this upper point here is showing uh, uh, upstream emissions, assuming that the power for pellet production is from a diesel generator, which is kind of the worst case. This, this center case is using the 2% uh, renewable biomass and using hydropower for electricity, which is kind of what is the what is happening right now. And then this is showing the 100% renewable case. So depending on what happens with the production of the fuel, you either have kind of comparable climate impacts relative to LPG, or you have essentially negligible climate impacts. Um, and then the health is is about a factor of two, or the the um, uh, intake estimated intake is about a factor of two higher than LPG. But um, as Ryan discussed, these get to the point where food emissions may dominate over combustion emissions. Um, and then finally, this is a comparison between the field Phillips data I talked about in the beginning of the talk versus here. And so you can see that you know essentially some part part of this is due to the use of pellets. So homogenized fuel really pushes this in uh, in a very good and good direction. So as far as a quick summary, um, we saw very significant reductions in emission factors and rates during in-use testing um, relative to the old sort of tiers. Um, the, the data suggests tier three for PM 2.5 and tier four for CO. Um, although about 10% of tests were what we call super emitters with um, emissions that were on par with at least coal, uh, traditional charcoal stoves. And, what, and we have observations of what was happening during these tests, and we can attribute this to things like uh, stove batteries that were not charged or refueling in a sort of improper order or using uh, kindling instead of uh, kerosene for starting. Uh, we typically saw these high em emission events during ignition and during the end of a, of a test or a cooking session. Um, we see uh, kind of variable, but um, uh, mostly scattering uh, SSAs from pellet stove or uh, from the high emitting pellet stoves. And then, uh, you know, the big, big takeaway is that the co-benefits associated with the use of this stove approach those from a modern fuel and stove. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the study participants and obviously the, the funding sources. And then Indian Yeri was great to work with in terms of the field work. This is uh, Ephraim Rakundo and uh, Bertil Campire who helped with the field work. And this is Wyatt, and they're all rocking the uh, NC State colors there. And then a bunch of people in my lab helped with analysis of the data. So thank you. We some, some extras. Those are extras, here. yeah. Sorry. These will be posted online, so people can feel free to reference them. Um, thank you very much, Andy. That was an excellent presentation. Um, before I spend just a few minutes talking about implications for the sector, um, I do want to introduce my colleague, Nirja Penamecha, who is our senior manager of technology and impacts. And because there was a lot of um, talk of tiers, I just want to have her say a few words about the tier systems. Uh, before we get into the sector impacts, might head off some questions we're going to get. Uh, thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the two-tier systems that were referenced uh, in Andy's and Ryan's presentations. Uh, several years ago, a system was developed that's commonly referred to as the ISO-IWA system that you may be familiar with that provided initial benchmarking to understand performance of cook stoves 
uh, tested in the lab using something called the water boiling test, an older protocol to assess cook stove performance. Um, over the past few years, though, uh, an ISO technical committee has developed a new standard with a new protocol and a new tier system associated with it. And so you'll notice that in Andy's presentation, he was referring to the previous IWA system. And in Ryan's presentation, he was referring to the new tier system that was published. Uh, I believe the new performance protocols were only published last month. So we're in a bit of a transition phase, which is why um, those two numbers were provided, but they are not comparable. So just wanted to clarify that now for those who may not be familiar with that, those systems. And happy to answer any further questions folks have on that. Thank you, Erja. So before we get into questions, which I see there are several flashing up here, I just want to you know, kind of summarize some of the things we heard and some broader tech takeaways for the whole sector, especially those from um, a less technical background. Um, I want to echo what Andy said at the beginning of his presentation is it's really exciting to see some positive results and getting some data demonstrating some actual clean and cleaner options for the sector. And as Ryan highlighted in his presentation, um, this is one piece of the puzzle, this data for really understanding climate impacts. It's adding a lot to the evidence base and there's definitely opportunity and the need for additional research. But with that said, um, both of these studies really add to the evidence base. The Nepal study really is the first study to measure emissions from biogas and LPG under typical household use settings. And the Rwanda study is one of the first to measure from the Mimimoto under typical household use. So as Donnie highlighted at the beginning, we've really been relying on lab data. So it's great to have some additional data from the field to look at. So the Nepal study added, I think 57, correct me if I'm wrong, new tests for biogas and six for LPG over the three seasons. And the Rwanda study added 91 uncontrolled tests and 59 for pellets, I believe that's right. So why this is matters and why is this useful for the sector? Um, these studies and this data can really be used as we look to um, produce more accurate assessments of the health and climate benefits, especially as we're seeing kind of a global transition and a lot of government supported programs, particularly for gas fuels and electric stoves. And this really also helps us build the case for um, those cleaner biomass options as well. So more data is always better and high quality data is even better than that. So we're happy to see some new numbers. Affordability is something I think all of you who are on the webinar and all of us in the sector at large talk about all the time. And in particular, affordability is a key concern for those higher performing technologies. And I think one of the key takeaways from this is that we see biogas and these higher performing biomass stoves may offer a more affordable option with the right business model or program. I think also uh, something important to consider here is these two studies are giving us more evidence for the suite of clean cooking options. So there's a lot of talk about LPG, but both of these studies show that, you know, here is biogas and another study on high performing biomass stoves such as the Mimimoto could be considered a viable step for households as they transition towards cleaner energy. Another key takeaway from this, which was touched on in both studies, is the need to be thinking about long-term sustainability. So as Ryan highlighted in the Nepal case, um, in terms of biogas, which I believe was originally a government-supported program, is that these can be really impactful long-term cooking options, but only if you have sustainable maintenance and customer support programs for these clean cooking interventions. We saw in the Rwanda case as well, the engineering has built this into their business model, emphasizing the customer service. So I think both of these studies show us that you can have both in government intervention programs and in private sector really need to think about long-term sustainability in terms of the provision of customer support programs, maintenance, whether that be a government program, private sector, or even a public-private partnership, which we're starting to see more of. So at this time, um, I want to turn it over to the question portion, if I can get actually see these questions. Is that from you, Ryan? Oh, I think it's for Ryan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this question is for Ryan. Do we know anything about the usage frequency of biogas versus wood in your sample and about the proportion of total useful cooking energy, which is supplied by biogas? 
Um, yeah, so with regard to usage, um, we're, so we're not done with that analysis of presentation. Um, just like for my observations, don't quote me on this, I mean, like roughly half of the energy, or half of this energy consumption was from wood stoves. Um, there's, you know, they're using the biogas stove for an hour or two a day, and they're using the wood stove for about the same amount. Um, and the, and then about the useful energy delivered, uh, we did not measure that uh, because there, there was, you know, a variety of cooking tasks that besides it's fairly easy to measure useful energy delivered when you're boiling a pot of water, or heating a pot of water, but um, when you're frying other things, it's um, it, uh, it's yeah, it's not as applicable. But um, I mean, a previous study um, by uh, Smith 2000, Kirk Smith reported the thermal efficiency to be 57 percent. I assumed it was 50 percent uh, when mapping our results to the ISO performance tiers. So yeah, I mean, roughly it's pretty well constrained, you know, 50% plus or minus 10% as the thermal efficiency of those stoves, which is similar to LPG. So we have another question for Ryan regarding um, household biogas plants in Nepal. Are they subsidized or subsidized or is the market self-sustaining? Yeah, I, it's my understanding they were all subsidized. It was part of the government uh, program the government um, provides the cost of the materials and a you know expert and then the um, residents are need to supply the labor um, to build the system and that's why also why all the systems are almost identical they're all following the same approved design um, of the national program Great. And we have a couple questions for Andy. So we have one question on if it's possible to convert to the new tiers or additional field testing needs to be conducted. And another question on if stove stacking is prevalent with the Mimi Meta stoves in Rwanda. Um, on the first, we can we can convert. I mean, we, we may have to make assumptions about uh, efficiency. We didn't directly measure that, but we have we have fuel use measurements, and so we can we can do that. Um, and I see the other questions about using uh, energy-based emission factors. That's something that we, we probably will do. And it's just a matter of, we know the energy content of our fuels. We've actually done some fuel analysis. So yeah, I think especially when comparing charcoal and biomass, we should be doing that. Um, the, you know, that the final figure I showed is sort of incorporating all that information. Um, stove stacking, uh, we did not look at that. I mean, we have sort of a very narrow snapshot um Pam Jagger has and others are doing a study looking kind of more broadly um I do feel like um they have found it, it, I think it varies by household certain households I think are exclusive pellet users some there is stacking um but I, I actually don't I don't I don't have any numbers to sort of back that up and I think uh, Indian area I think is experimenting a lot with their business model in terms of how people can buy fuel and you know basically working towards making the, uh, this their that people's sort of sole cooking um, option. So I want to switch to a question around cooking aerosol from biogas and LPG were mentioned as climate cooling. Please explain more about the climate cooling aspect about of black carbon and how it may exceed the climate warming aspects of black carbon precipitate on ice pack, for instance. Either of you want to answer that? Um, well, yeah, that's that would take some modeling, I think. But I would say in both of these cases, I mean, it's a it's a really really drastic reduction in emissions relative to either of any of the solid fuel options. So, um, I mean, I think that that will definitely show up in in BC being deposited on ice as well. Um, and I think in terms of the atmospheric impacts, to do it right, you really have to put this into a climate model. Um, but I think the, the nice thing about kind of both of these cases is the emissions are so far reduced that you can pretty much model this uh, by almost turning off all the emissions because you know it's like a 99% reduction uh, or a 100-fold reduction 
is is huge. Um, so that my sense is that, uh, yeah, I mean you can model that, but it's it's going to be a almost complete elimination of that source. Yeah. So I'll uh, add to that. I mean, yeah, our conclusion that the emissions of biogas are cooling is is because. If from these real cooking events, most of the emissions are organic coming from the food that's being cooked. If you look at the cases where just water is being uh, heated and there is no cooking emissions, um, I, there is, we have some evidence that shows our results were, um, you know, that, uh, that the emissions coming from the actual fuel combustion are more EC. And, th and this is verified in, you know, laboratory studies uh, of combustion, like you can you can produce soot in the laboratory with both uh, LPG and methane flame. Um, yeah, and I just want to echo what Andy has said in terms of like the CO2 equivalent of these aerosol emissions. It's essentially um, zero because they're so low. Um, but you, you would really need to evaluate the size of the other pieces of the puzzle to, to before you can actually conclude that it's negligible. I hope that answered the question. And we have another question for Ryan. Would you know how the manure digested slurry is stored and applied on the field? The question is motivated by the potential increase in ammonia losses from storage and application. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, there's a pretty large variety in practices. I mean, there is like a compost pit that the slurry flows into, and then there's different practices uh, employed in terms of mixing that slurry with um, with our other organic matter to try to capture some of that nitrogen and apply it to the fields or uh, in some cases it's applied directly to the fields um, so yeah I think there's a pretty large um, variety a large distribution of how um, the slurry is actually treated in some cases uh, a lot of the nitrogen or most of it is um, evaporating as ammonia and then I think if it's handled properly then uh, a lot of it can be retained uh, to use as fertilizer. Great and for this person is last but for those who've asked the recording will be posted on the Alliance website and so will the slides so you'll be able to reference those later. Um, this is for Andy. How would you describe the quality of the pellets sold by your field partner? How critical is the quality of the pellets to achieve significant emission reductions? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I am not a pellet expert. Um, I, we did do, we had a, a lab at NC State do analysis of the pellets and we know that they're very uniform in things like um, ash content and, um, and calorific value were very uniform. So I, I know in Inari, that's been a big part of the challenge is getting, because their production facility is in Gisenye, so getting that up to speed, getting uh, sort of, uh, I mean, I think reliability of the equipment and power and all that has been a big, a pretty big challenge. They're in the midst of commissioning a much bigger plant, but I, I, I my sense is that they, um, they, uh, you know, have it, have a, a pretty, you know, a, a good product. Um, and uh, as far as quality of pellets, I think it's important. I think it's especially important because if they crumble, for example, people may not use them or you're not going to get the right airflow. So um, I know there have been, you know, for example, if people don't store them carefully and they get wet and they crumble apart, um, you don't, you won't get, uh, I don't think you get good combustion. So I think it's pretty important to have quality, both in terms of the manufacturer, but also in terms of kind of handling and storage. Um, we have some question on how can the pellet stoves be available to other communities? So we may want to direct this question to Indianary, but Andy is going to um, Well, Indianary is very actively pursuing a kind of scale up of this in Rwanda. And I know a lot of other people have expressed interest. I mean, just talking to the folks at Indianary, you know, and they're, I think they're very interested in and kind of sharing what they've learned so that this can be done in other places. I know right now they're focusing on Rwanda, but the, like I said, they've worked in Gisenye, they've worked, they're working in at least one refugee camp and they're really trying to ramp up. Um, I think thus far having the pellet supply has been kind of the, you know, not like kind of the rate limiting step. Um, and like I said, they're in the midst of commissioning a much bigger uh, plant. So I think that I, I imagine, you know, 
there's going to be a, a, you know a much more distribution sort of at least within Rwanda. Great. Let's make sure we get through. We have a question here about a little bit of a statement, but this work is academically interesting, but extremely expensive to what field experience tells us. Um, do Brian or Annie, do either of you want to respond to that? Um, that's certainly a challenge. And I think, I mean, I guess my sense is one that has to be addressed, but it's all a matter of comparing options. I think we have seen that if we want to address this, the emissions for these things, we have to go to something that costs money. <laughs> we have to either, and I, my belief is that process biomass has a lot of um, potential, but you need to have investment to have facilities to process the fuel and, and, a, and a device that can burn it in a clean way. Um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, that this is a, a direction. I think, I think it's, you know, on a sort of capital uh, investment standpoint, it's, it's on a different scale than something like LPG. Um, and so I think it offers some very interesting opportunities. Do Donnie or Nirja, who are also on the line, want to add anything to that? Or otherwise, we can go to the next question. Okay, so we have another question about when you said 90% of PM 2.5 comes from frying, is this for biogas and LPG stoves only? Right, right. yeah, I was referring to gas stoves. Um, for the wood stoves, the emissions of frying are not detectable. I mean, they're pretty much negligible. The you know because the emissions from the wood combustion are orders of magnitude higher. I think we answered this question about stove stacking and from one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we we answered this one. Uh, maybe the personal exposure question. Yes, there are some questions about personal exposure, which just disappeared. I think one of the questions is, was personal exposure measured in either of these studies? Yes, there it is. Any personal exposure data is collected for these studies? For, for our study, no, it was just emissions. I mean, we would like to do more of this, and we're seeking funding, so anyone out there? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and we did not measure personal exposure during our study, but there is personal exposure measurements being conducted in the study area by um, leaders in Nepal. Uh, yeah, and I'll also say that Pam Jagger is leading a study where they are doing, not necessarily in the same household, but they are doing personal exposure measurements. So there will be data um, forthcoming at some point. Great, and here we have a question um, on it's great to have the results on BC for those cooking solutions. Are there plans to do a long-term study with sensors to quantify how much people are using these cooking, cooking solutions compared to traditional cooking methods? And by long-term, I mean six months to a year. Um, a year of sensor-based usage monitoring. Uh, I would say no plans, but I'm, I'm working on a proposal right now. <laughs> um, so, Yeah, I would like to. Maybe we can partner with NextSleep to do that. <laughs> So if anyone wants to fund Ryan and Andy to do these studies. <laughs> and I do, I should mention that the leaders yeah. study that's happening in the same site that Ryan was working on is doing uh, longer term usage monitoring. I don't remember the exact amount of time, but that data should be available sometime late next year. They'll have over six months um, on biogas, LPG, um, the, clean, the, the fuel mix within a home. So that will give us some interesting information there. And that's in Nepal, just to reiterate, perfect. Was moisture content for wood considered in the Nepal study? Um, yes. Well, so we didn't really investigate the sensitivity to moisture content, but we did measure it and um, it adjust for it in the results. The, the results are for, you know, kilograms of dry fuel. And we so we adjust for that in the energy content also of the fuel. 
Um, we're just going to take, I think, we have time for about two more questions. So this question's for Andy. A lot of great insights. Interesting side note is that no seasonality could be observed, at least not for firewood. First, is this observed in other studies as well? Second, can we actually say that the two sets of tests have been conducted in different seasons, given that December and May are both the ending months of the two rainy seasons in Rwanda? Um, thank you. First, um, yeah, we only saw any seasonality in, in uh, CO from charcoal. Um, we didn't see a big difference in fuel moisture across seasons, if if I recall. So, and it's true, we didn't we didn't get true dry and true wet. We were just sort of limited by schedule uh, for when we actually ended up there. And it turned out that we kind of ended up catching two partially wet and partially dry seasons. Um, I've done work previously uh, in India, and I have a paper in Geo Health um, that. Uh, from an intervention study with rocket stoves, and we saw a big seasonality in emissions from wood stoves, and we can link that to fuel moisture. And then I'm, uh, my doctoral student, um, Maxim Islam, is working on a set of data from India right now. We're seeing the same thing uh, in, across seasons in, in India. So I think, yeah, we have an indication that fuel moisture does play a pretty big role, especially in PM emissions. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, Ryan, you might be able to answer this in terms of what kind of support is extended to the households with biogas units in Nepal by the government towards the maintenance and repairs of biogas units so that the life of a biogas plant is extended? Yeah, so um, there was a lot of the systems were damaged in the 2015 earthquakes. In a lot of cases, people's houses fell on their anaerobic digester. Um, and so there was um, support, for, there was repairs were made. The government did provide subsidies to repair those systems. Um, but I think right now the, I mean, it's kind of in transition because there, the Global Alliance and leaders in Nepal are actively like, you know, working to develop a maintenance program or, you know, to, to look at the maintenance of the biogas systems in that area and uh, improve it. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what we observed is that there was uh, potentially a, a gap in maintenance. Like if you interview the household residents, you know, they could acknowledge or they identify things that are not working well with their system, but they're not really uh, like acting on it or reporting it to calling, you know, maintenance technician to get it repaired. Uh, but I think that's changing in that region. I think in the future, what we'll see the biogas systems uh, in tip-top shape. Great. So I want to give Donnie time to wrap up, but I want to thank everyone again for attending and asking such thoughtful questions. And thank you again to CCAC for funding this work. And after Donnie gives our final remarks, um, I just want to remind everyone that a survey is going to pop up. Um, I do ask that everyone takes the time to fill it out. As I said at the beginning, this will really help us to tailor these um, webinars and other kind of presentations that the Alliance and others do in the future so that we can make sure they are the most useful for our partners. So, Donnie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Katie. Um, really appreciate both Ryan and Andy, your presentations. I think that this is really the first step in, in showing us the, what the impacts on climate can be when you're actually using a stove um, in the field, not just doing a water boiling test or a controlled cooking test. So that was really interesting. And it also shows us that the higher performing biomass stoves um, when used with pellets are, are getting to almost a clean. And so that is also very interesting. So I think these data are kind of the first that are showing this and hopefully we'll be able to see some more things like this coming out in the future that'll help us get a better understanding of the overall impact. So again, thanks everybody for your time and also the participants, your interest in this. And if you have any further questions, I encourage you to contact Ryan or Andy um, individually or us if you would like. I think their information is on these slides so you can just go and find their email addresses so again thanks again for participating and for the presenters and again for the clean air um, climate and clean air coalition for funding this work uh, everybody I hope you have a nice day or evening or morning wherever you are thank you everyone thanks